liftoff process of multi-junction solar cells by using porous germanium sacrificial layers. With this uh, NREL chart that uh, you know already, this represents the efficiency of different photovoltaic technology uh, during the last 40 years. What is important to notice here is that uh, most of uh, conventional photovoltaic technology such as flat panels and silicon solar cells have already reached a plateau in terms of efficiency. And in fact, their efficiency increase is uh, very slow because their practical efficiency is already very close from the theoretical efficiency limit. However, there are uh, two main families of technologies that are quite promising in terms of efficiencies. The first one is this uh, new PV uh, approaches. This includes uh, organic solar cells, quantum dots, uh, colloidal solar cells, and other <coughs> new technologies that have a very high potential of efficiency increase. Uh, on the other hand, there is this uh, very highly efficient multi-junction solar cells that are made of 3-5 uh, materials. <coughs> and in this case, these cells are composed of multiple junctions having cascaded band gap that are electrically and uh, optically connected in series. This uh, allows to um, adjust the solar cell absor absorption to the solar spectrum and thereby minimizing the thermalization and transmission losses. So as uh, Christian said uh, yesterday, uh, the record performance of these uh, solar cells were recently reported by uh, his group in the Fraunhofer Institute on a four-junction solar cell uh, by wafer bonding, and the performance is about 45%, which is almost twice any of the other technologies. However, the main um, we have the theoretical efficiency limit, which is higher than 70%, which gives us a lot of room for improvement. However, the main disadvantage of this technology is uh, the cost. Actually, the cost of the cells is uh, almost two orders of magnitude higher than other technologies. And this explains why, uh, historically, this technology was mainly uh, dedicated almost exclusively to uh, power satellites. Uh, until one came up with the idea of, instead of using these uh, solar cells in a flat panel, uh, flat panel configuration, as shown here, why not use a very small piece of this uh, sophisticated material and put it under a uh, concentrator, as we can see here. And uh, by doing so, obviously, you transfer the cost from this uh, expensive 3-5 uh, uh, solar cells into uh, uh, this concentrator optics, which potentially can be uh, much uh, lower and made from Earth-abundant materials such as glass or polymer. So for those who prefer equations, this is a very simplified version of the cost of energy equation. And you can see that <coughs> the terms here are the solar cost, uh, the cell cost, other cost, solar radiation, and efficiency. So by using multi-junction cell, you basically uh, increase the efficiency, but you dramatically increase the cell cost. Uh, by do using concentrator, you, of course, add some uh, other costs, such as the concentrator cost and also the uh, tracker cost, but uh, you uh, dramatically reduce the solar cell cost by reducing the area, and you dramatically increase the solar radiation. So you can end up with uh, uh, a cost of energy that uh, can be uh, interesting. Um, <coughs> So many uh, systems of, uh, to concentrate light exist. Uh, these are a few of them, but I'm sure we will see more of them uh, tomorrow in Simon, uh, Professor Simon's Fafar talk. Uh, but uh, what is important to note here is that what you need to concentrate light, you need the concentrator itself, the cell or the receiver and the tracker to follow the sun, because here we are harvesting only the direct component of the solar spectrum. Um, but uh, for uh, the po uh, most popular uh, concentrator configurations are, for example, parabolic mirrors, where you use this parabolic mirror to usually concentrate the sunlight onto a dense array of multi-junction cells. 
so the advantage of this technology is uh, the simplicity of the fabrication of this uh, dish uh, that concentrates light and also this uh, allow you to uh, use active cooling that could be very efficient in a uh, very hot area where you can keep the cell temperature at the optimum uh, f uh, functioning temperature. There is also the Fresnel lens where you use a Fresnel lens plate to usually concentrate the sunlight on a single cell. So the advantage of this uh, configuration can be uh, uh, that the fact that the, the panels are flatter, uh, the profile is uh, low as we can see here, and also you can use passive cooling to cool the cells. Uh, <coughs> you might have noticed here that uh, most of the, uh, the only component that is made of semiconductor is the receiver or the cell itself. And most of the other components are uh, basic technologies that are, for example, mirror, steel, structure, control system, etc. So this can be very interesting for emerging countries because most of the components can be uh, made or assembled there and thereby uh, drive an economy and create jobs. Um, <coughs> uh, the last point is that CPV uh, promises the lowest uh, levelized cost of electricity, especially for high TNI locations. And uh, here we s see again this word of uh, uh, direct normal irradiation uh, and we can uh, easily see that uh, there is uh, a big market over the globe. For example, in Australia, North Africa, Middle East, Southern Europe, South Africa, part of the US and Latin America. Um, but uh, you have to know that uh, the DNI in Canada, if you compare it, for example, to some countries in Europe, like Germany or even Great Britain, actually the DNI is uh, pretty good and we hope that uh, CPV can be implemented uh, in Canada in the near future. <coughs> uh, at our uh, institute we work on different aspects of the CPV uh, system and technology. We work on material and structures, on the cell fabrication, on packaging and on systems. But I'm personally more involved with the material uh, part. So we work on the development and the growth of new materials such as dilute nitride materials. And uh, my colleague uh, Bousseiri will give you more details about this. Uh, we also work on tunnel junction, quantum dots. Uh, quantum dots are used to increase the current of uh, the middle subcells, the gallium arsenide. And we have one important part of our work is the uh, uh, virtual substrate or substrate engineering. And uh, in this case, we have developed different strategies to, uh, to create uh, different type of uh, uh, virtual substrate that help us to uh, grow new alloys or for example, uh, integrate material that are naturally incompatible in terms of lattice constant. So the first uh, 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 virtual substrate is uh, the lattice tunable substrate. Here the uh, goal is to create a growth template for group four and three five materials that doesn't have substrate. In this case, we use uh, porous uh, uh, or mesoporous silicon as a stress generating material. So by associating a thin film to porous uh, silicon, we can strain it in a controllable way. And here I show you some results. Sorry, so you can see the in-plane uh, lattice constant that we can control over a wide range of lattice constant between silicon and gallium arsenide. Uh, okay, the, the second uh, virtual substrate concerns a compliant substrate. The goal here is to integrate 3,5 uh, on silicon, and in this case we use the, uh, the flexibility of a mesoporous silicon film to reduce the strain during the growth of gallium arsenide on silicon. And uh, thanks to this approach, we were able to uh, enhance significantly the quality, the crystalline quality of gallium arsenide grown on silicon. The last uh, uh, 
uh, substrate engineering method that uh, uh, that we we developed is the lift off process, and I will focus the rest of my talk about this. So, <coughs> the motivation for this work were uh, sorry, I'll just uh, so. Uh, as you might already know, most of multi-junction solar cells are grown on germanium substrates. Actually, germanium is a very good substrate because it offers a very close lattice constant to grow gallium arsenide and gallium indium phosphate. Um, the second thing is that germanium has a narrow band gap, and this allows to absorb the infrared radiation and thereby increasing the efficiency of the cell. Uh, however, these germanium substrates are expensive. In fact, they account for almost half the price of the multi-junction solar cells. So now if we look at a cross-sectional view of a multi-junction solar cell, you can notice that the active area here is only a few micrometer thick. Sorry for the... Uh, and uh, actually the rest of the substrate is only used as a mechanical support. So if we can be able to separate this active area from its initial substrate and reuse the germanium wafer, this could be very interesting because it could not only uh, reduce the germanium consumption and thereby reducing the cell cost, but it can also reduce thermal and electrical resistances, uh, which are important for very highly concentrated photovoltaics. And the last point is this can reduce the weight which is uh, significantly important for space application. Now, if we look at this uh, chart here, uh, it represents the germanium price evolution as a function of years. And what you can notice is that the germanium price has increased by a factor of three over six years. So we think that this trend will continue in the future because, first of all, germanium is a rare metal. It is uh, 10 times less abundant than gold on Earth. The second is that we might uh, expect uh, a significant increase of the demand in the future on this material because there were uh, many recent big breakthrough in germanium-based devices. <coughs> Some examples in electronics with the development of high mobility transistors uh, uh, for CMOS applications, in photonics with the recent discovery of the direct band gap emissions, so germanium can be made uh, used for lasers, and also in photovoltaics, which includes uh, this uh, very promising thermal photovoltaic field and multi-junction solar cells, of course, for CPV and for space applications. So now I'll show you uh, our approach that we propose to recycle our reused germanium substrate. So we start with a bulk germanium substrate. And by using a very simple electrochemical uh, uh, etching technique, we create a double porosity layer with a low porosity on top and a high porosity on the bottom. So next, by annealing this structure, we transform it to what we call quasi-monocrystalline germanium, which is basically germanium with nanovoids in it. And uh, a separation layer underneath here. Uh, since this uh, quasi monocrystalline germanium has bulk like properties, it can be used as a seed layer for the growth of the 3 5 subcells. And next, we use this uh, weakened interface here to separate the film, bond it to inexpensive substrate, and reuse the germanium wafer to produce more solar cells. <coughs> so, a similar approach was already developed for uh, silicon thin film solar cells uh, and uh, it was very successful because they could obtain uh, uh, efficiencies which are uh, very comparable to uh, uh, the same cell on uh, uh, bulk substrate. And here I'll show you uh, a short video to show you how they can, after this uh, uh, process, separate the film from its initial substrate. So here you go. So here what, what's happening is that you bond the layer to this glass substrate and by applying ultrasonic uh, bath, you break bas basically the porous silicon and then the substrate separate on a full wafer scale. 
Um, okay, so this has worked for silicon, but why should this work for multijunction solar cells? Uh, to answer this, again, we come back to uh, comparison of record performance in crystalline silicon solar cells. So if you look at uh, these uh, numbers here, if you take bulk silicon solar cells, crystalline of course, uh, and you compare it with the thin film crystalline solar cells that were transferred by using this uh, uh, porous process, you can notice that uh, most of uh, the drop in efficiency is mainly due to photocurrent losses of around 12%. Now, if we look at the numbers from uh, multijunction solar cells, we can find that the germanium subcells has a road already uh, a significant excess current, so we wouldn't expect any photocurrent losses, and thereby we, we think that uh, it is possible to make uh, multijunction solar cells with the neglectable uh, drop in efficiency. Uh, on the other hand, there is a big problem, is that this uh, liftoff process was possible f uh, for silicon thanks to the development of the porous silicon technology. For example, here in 2000, from Lehman's review, you can see that at that time already we could make uh, porous silicon layers with very controlled porosities and, uh, and morphologies. For example, you can see this very nice low porosity layer and this also uh, very clean uh, high porosity layer that were uh, produced uh, in a reproducible manner. <coughs> it's really not the case for germanium because if you look at relatively recent state of the art, you can find that we could uh, produce this randomly distributed macropores or nanoporous layer with this uh, 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 thicknesses below 500 nanometers because of what we call uh, a, a continuous dissolution of the already formed layer. Uh, and you can notice that the interface is not controlled, so clearly before moving on to the liftoff process, we need to develop first the porosification uh, process for germanium. So this is what, where we begin our uh, research. And uh, we uh, focused on this, but uh, first of all, be before moving to the experimental results, let me say a few words about the porous semiconductor formation principle. So we use a very simple uh, setup that is called electrochemical cell. Uh, here in the schematic, it is composed uh, from a reaction cell, uh, a back electrode, which is the anode, and uh, uh, a front electrode or a control electrode, which is the cathode. And to form the porous layer, we put a semiconductor wafer here against the anode. And uh, when we apply uh, anodic current, uh, what happens is that the surface in contact with the electrolyte uh, is etched uh, spontaneously by creating an interconnected uh, network of pores. This doesn't require any pre-patterning or lithography, uh, it's uh, really spontaneous and uh, self-assembled technique. Uh, but uh, even this, we have some control. Uh, so you can see here, we can control the morphology by choosing wisely the type and the doping of the initial substrate. The porosity, <coughs> which is the fraction of voids or air in the material can be controlled by the current density and the electrolyte concentration, and the thickness is a function of the etching time. So uh, this typical parameters works uh, very well, work very well with the silicon and some other semiconductors, but uh, they really don't work with germanium, because uh, in the case of germanium, you need what we call to use a bipolar electrochemical etching. This is because uh, when you use only anodic etching in the case of germanium, you end up with the hydroxyl terminated uh, uh, germanium surface, and this type of surface is not stable and leads to a continuous dissolution of the already formed layer. Uh, so when you use a cathodic uh, uh, bias, or uh, this passivate the surface by exchanging this hydroxyl terminated surface by a hydrogen terminated surface. 
And uh, for example, sorry. So if you look at here, I show you example of uh, samples that were uh, etched during the same time duration and by using the same etching current density. But uh, as you can see. Uh, when we used uh, optimal passivation, we were able to obtain a much thicker layer with uh, homogeneous in-depth uh, uh, properties such as porosity, etc., and avoiding this uh, damage to the surface. So here we show how, uh, to which extent, the passivation step is important to form the porous germanium. Uh, furthermore, we have studied the uh, porosity as a function of uh, etching current density, as you can see that the porosity can be tuned uh, over a wide range between 20% and 70%. <coughs> and you can see that uh, for uh, both low and high porosities, we can have a very nice interface and we control very well the morphology. So this uh, material have also very interesting properties, for example, in terms of optical emission properties, we found that uh, it emits light above the bulk germanium bend gap, and that is this uh, em uh, emission in the near infrared is tunable with the size of the particle. Uh, <coughs> and here we have uh, done some TEM observation at high resolution, and we've shown that this. Uh, uh, emission originate from uh, quantum confinement effect within the crystallite because their size is much lower than the exciton bore radius in germanium. So we have also uh, showed that uh, the formation of uh, porous germanium multilayer is possible by alternating low and high porosities as shown here. Uh, this is simply by using starting with a low current and then uh, high current here, uh, low current, etc. And uh, what is uh, important to note is that when we change the current to higher currents, uh, we don't affect the already formed uh, low porosity layer. So this can have uh, important application, for example, uh, in uh, uh, opt uh, for optical application, for example, to make uh, Bragg mirrors or cavities, etc. Um, okay, so <coughs> now that we have developed this uh, porosification uh, technology for germanium, let's go back to our liftoff process. So by applying the optimum parameters, we have created this low porosity uh, on high porosity B layer. Uh, the low porosity was uh, about 25% porous, and this one is 70% uh, porous. Then we studied the annealing uh, uh, conditions, and we found that 700 degrees C uh, transformed this uh, uh, porous B layer into a useful structure composed of this uh, quasi monocrystalline germanium with a separation layer here. Um, so, obviously, this transformation is not due to the melting of porous uh, germanium because uh, uh, the melting point for germanium is at much higher temperatures but is rather due to surface diffusion, which is due to the high volume uh, to uh, the surface to volume ratio driven by minimizing the free surface energy. Um, uh, next, uh, what we've done is that since this quasi monocrystalline germanium has a bulk like properties, we try to grow gallium arsenide on top of it. And uh, as you can see here, and uh, uh, we have studied uh, by X-ray diffraction the quality of the gallium arsenide and we find that the gallium arsenide is a single crystal and if you look at the line width of the peak this indicates a very high quality very comparable to what you can obtain on bulk germanium so uh, this uh, this is uh, um, th this give us uh, hope that this Ca can be used uh, the quasi monocrystalline germanium as seed film for epitaxial growth of uh, high quality three fives. Um, we, and to prove that the layer of transfer is possible, we've done a very simple experiment where we use a sticky pad in this uh, triangular shape. And by sticking this onto the surface of the sample, uh, by removing it, we were able to transfer a part of the film. 
And you can see the trace of the pad here as an evidence that the film has been transferred. Now, if we look at the interface here, uh, you can see how the heterostructure is separating by breaking the remaining bonds between the quasi-monocrystalline germanium and the germanium substrate. So this brings us to the conclusions. So uh, we have developed the porous uh, germanium uh, technology, which could be useful for this liftoff process, but uh, for many other applications. We have uh, demonstrated the epitaxial growth of 3,5 uh, on this quasi-monocrystalline germanium layers. Uh, we also demonstrated uh, proof of concept for the layer uh, liftoff process. Um, I, and I would end up by saying that this is a promising technique for reducing germanium material consumption, but also for reducing thermal uh, electrical resistances for next generation uh, CPV cells. I would like to thank uh, my colleagues uh, at the CPV team at the University of Sherbrooke, uh, members of Sun Lab at the University of Ottawa, and uh, former members of uh, Cerium Technologies for fruitful discussions, and also would like to thank the Canadian Center for Electron Microscopy uh, for uh, uh, TEM observation, and thank you for your attention.